warm in here, but I trust me when I say this. I'm warmer than you are, okay? Trust me when I say that. So, all right, well, let's begin. So open your Bible up to Jonah's chap- Jonah chapters 1 and 2. And as you're opening there, I'll tell you a little story. The first time my wife and I ever met, it was actually right here at Riverview Baptist Church. However, about six months before we met, we had been talking to one another over email and on the phone. We met uh, through an online dating site, believe it or not. And for a long time, we didn't even tell anybody that that's how we met when people asked us how we met because it used to be that meeting people online was somewhat of an embarrassing thing to do, although nowadays it's totally normal. I guess you could say that Betsy and I met online before meeting online was cool. We were kind of the pioneers of that. And I remember that I was the one to initiate the contact between the two of us. She had placed a personal ad for herself on AOL Personals. That's how long ago it was. AOL was still a thing. AOL Personals, and I think she did it as a dare from a friend, and I saw her ad, and I began to electronically pursue her, if you will. And uh, so we began to talk, and as I got to know her more and more, I began to pursue her more, and as she got to know me, believe it or not, she actually began to pursue me, something that still surprises me. But If you're married, you know what it is like to pursue the affections of another person. And you also hopefully know what it's like to have someone pursue your affections. And even if you're single, you probably know what it is like to pursue the affections of another person and to be pursued. Well, God is a pursuing kind of God. He's a God who pursues people. Now, not in a romantic way, of course, but he is nonetheless pursuing the affections of human beings. And when we pursue a mate, we do so in the hopes that eventually our feelings of affection will be reciprocated, right? That the person we're pursuing will then return that that affection to us. It would be fruitless for a man to pursue a woman who had no interest in him. If his feelings are not returned, then there's no point. Well, when God pursues a person, that's the position he is in. Because there is no human hope that a person would ever reciprocate God's feelings of affection. Although God pursues people, it turns out that nobody pursues God. Romans chapter 3 verse 11 says that there is no one who seeks after God. God seeks after people. But people do not seek after God. It's a one-way relationship. Even so, God continues to pursue even people who don't want him. Even the most vile, rotten, wicked people who are shaking their fists at him. God pursues them. And these first two chapters of the book of Jonah, and really this whole book, show us a God who is in pursuit of people. He desires to win their affections for himself. He desires their worship, their obedience, their love, and their devotion. But again, none of the people God pursues in this book of Jonah show any natural interest in returning his affection. And so today I'd like to show you three different groups of people in the book of Jonah whom God is pursuing and to show you how and why he pursues them. There is much to learn from this book about our God and about his desire to save sinners. So the very first people that we see God pursuing in this book are the Ninevites. If you look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great, zi- that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, which essentially ruled the world at this point in time in history. And if you look again at verse 2, you'll notice that God calls Nineveh that great city. Now, what God means by calling the city great is not that it is a city of great culture or art or music or that it was a wonderful vacation destination or any other positive qualifier. Rather, what God means is to accentuate the city's greatness in doing evil. That's what God says. Their evil has come up before me. 
The Assyrian Empire was known for their brutality, and Nineveh was the capital of the empire. It was the face of the wickedness of that people. Now, let me give you some examples here of how wicked they were. And I'm going to tell you some things, and I want to tell you that I'm not telling you them to be salacious or to gross you out, but so that you can understand just how wicked Nineveh was as a city. And parents, you might want to take note and talk about some of these things later with your kids. This is actually an example, a quote from an Assyrian king named Ashurnasirpal II, who ruled the Assyrian Empire from 883 to 859 BC. This is what he said of one of his conquests. Quote, I flayed the skin from as many nobles as had rebelled against me and draped their skins over the pile of corpses. I cut off the heads and built with them a tower before their city. I burnt their adolescent boys and girls. I captured many troops alive. I cut off some of their arms and hands. I cut off of others their noses, ears, and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made one pile of the living and one of the heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city." And now, believe it or not, that is the edited version of what the Assyrians were guilty of. I didn't even share with you the even more grotesque and barbaric things they did. It gets worse than that. Now, you can probably begin to understand why Jonah wasn't too excited about going to uh, be a prophet to the people of Nineveh. That's what God tells him to do, though. Verse 2, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and to call out against it. And and Jonah says, yeah, right. (laughs) Would you want to go to call out against the people like that? If you did, you'd probably end up with your head on the business end of a spike. And then also, I'm sure there was a part of Jonah that didn't want God to save the Ninevites. He didn't want to go to Nineveh and proclaim the word of God because then they might turn and God might save them. And Jonah doesn't want that for them because look at the kind of people they were. Why would God want to pursue these Ninevites? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because if he did, God might use Jonahites to save or jo- <laughs> God might use Jonah to save the Ninevites. And that is something that Jonah doesn't want at all. If you think about it, the closest modern-day equivalent to these Assyrians and these Ninevites would probably be the Nazis, although I would venture to guess that the Assyrians were probably worse and even more barbaric. So think about that for just a minute. Does it maybe make your skin crawl to think about God pursuing and wanting to save Nazis? Does it make you a bit uneasy to think that God wanted Hitler to turn from his sin and come to salvation? If it does, then you know how Jonah felt about the idea of God saving Assyrians, or particularly these Ninevites. But you know what? God did want to pursue them. God did want to save these Ninevites. And maybe you're like Jonah, and you wonder why God would want to save people like the Ninevites who skinned their enemies alive and you know, made towers out of their heads. Why would God want to save people like that? That's called the scandal of grace. God pursues vile, wicked, despicable people. God desires to save vile, wicked, despicable people. And obviously not because of anything that they have done to deserve being saved. After all, again, the Ninevites skinned their enemies alive. There's nothing that they have earned except hell. No, God pursues vile, wicked, and despicable people because He is good. Because he loves us even though we are lost in sin. And that is the scandal of the gospel. It's that God pursues warlords who torture their enemies in the most gruesome ways you can imagine. God pursues them. God pursues Nazis. He pursues racists and murderers and criminals and adulterers and the sexually deviant. He pursues the disobedient. He pursues you. Whatever disgusting, filth pit of sin you are in right now, God is pursuing you right there. He has come into that filth pit to find you. 
And if you don't like the thought of God pursuing despicable people, do you know why that is? It's because you think that you are somehow better than them. But you're not. You think that you deserve salvation more than they do. But you don't. Again, Romans 3 says that all have turned away. All have become worthless. Their throat is an open grave. Their mouths are full of curses and bitterness. And in their path is ruin and misery. That is who you are. But there is good news, and the good news is that God is pursuing you. He's pursuing those Ninevites. He was pursuing the Nazis. He's pursuing all sinners. And he comes to where they are into that pit of sin and finds them there, and he desires to save them from that pit through his son, Jesus Christ. So did God pursue those wicked Ninevites? He did, because he is good. And also in this story, God is pursuing a group of sailors that we read about. So if you look at verse 3 of Jonah 1, it says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us a thought to us that we may not perish. So pause there for a minute. Now, here we have a group of sailors that Jonah has conscripted to bring him to Tarshish, which is about as far away from Nineveh as you can get, about 2,000 miles away. (laughs) Jonah doesn't mess around. If he's getting out of here, he's getting out of here, as far away as he can go. And these sailors that he conscripts are pagans. They do not worship the true God. They believed in phony, made-up gods who acted as good luck charms that could help you out when you got into trouble. So these sailors here really are in the same spiritual boat as the Ninevites. They are hopelessly lost in their sin. But God is in pursuit of these sailors. He wants to save them. So in order to get their attention, he sends them into a storm and he plops a prophet onto the deck of their ship in the form of Jonah. So now let's look at verse 7 of chapter 1. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country, and what of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So pause there again. Now when the lot falls to Jonah, then the sailors get an idea of just who it is that is pursuing them. It is the Lord, the maker of the land and the sea. And it's like a light bulb goes off in their head and they think to themselves, wait wait a minute, we're, we're on the sea and this guy is at odds with the one who made the sea. There's a problem there. Now let's go on. Verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. And then the most important verse concerning these sailors is verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. 
So by the end of this harrowing experience, these sailors feared the Lord exceedingly. They made sacrifices to him and they made vows to serve him. Listen, God was in pursuit of these sailors and they found him. God found them and they found him. But what you need to notice is that it took a storm to get their attention. See, at the beginning of the day, these sailors were just regular old pagans, right? They were on their way to Tarshish, just another day. But by the end of the day, they were worshipers of the one true God. And the difference maker in that day was the storm, was the storm that God sent upon them. God pursued these sailors with a storm because it was through the storm that they were introduced to God. Because when the storm came, they called Jonah up to call out to his God, and maybe that God would give them a thought and save their lives. But Jonah said, wait, 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 I don't just serve a God, I serve the God, the maker of the land and the sea, and this storm is here because of me. And the sailors begin to realize this as well, that God had done as it had pleased him, it says, and they would submit themselves then to him. And once this ordeal was over, these sailors had had an encounter with the true and living God. And what did they do when they came away from that encounter? They sacrificed to him and they made vows to serve him and him alone. Now the point here is that sometimes God pursues us by sending us through a storm. Because sometimes only a storm is going to be enough to get our attention. These sailors would not have found God had they not been through the storm, had Jonah never hired them to take him to Tarshish. See, God's method of pursuing these sailors was to give them something difficult. I think you would agree that going through that storm was rather unpleasant. They literally thought they were going to die. But God had a good purpose in that storm, and that was to draw these sailors to himself. But it took something terrifying to get them to trust in him. And that might be true of you too. Perhaps God is pursuing you, and for whatever reason, you're not listening. You're just going about your business day to day as you usually do. God might send a storm to you to shake you up, to get your attention. And although that storm might be unpleasant in the moment, it's what is best for you Because in that storm, you will meet the God who is pursuing you. I imagine those sailors weren't very happy about going through that storm. But that's what was best for them. Because in that storm, they met the God who was in pursuit of them. And then finally, in these chapters, we see God's pursuit of the main character of this story. And that is Jonah. Specifically, I think we see three ways that God is pursuing Jonah. The first is that God pursues Jonah in spite of Jonah's disobedience. As we've already looked at the beginning of chapter 1, God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah thought about it for half a second and said, Nope, I'm not doing that. Those people are barbarians. And so he packed up his stuff, he got on board board a ship, and he went 2,000 miles away in the exact opposite direction that God told him to go. And just imagine the arrogance of that. Imagine the hubris that must be required to tell the Lord of the universe, no. Imagine how within his rights, God would have been to have just squashed Jonah right then and there. And if not that, think of how justified God would have been to say, fine, Jonah, forget you. You know what? I'll go find somebody who is interested in being a part of what I'm doing in the world. But God doesn't do any of that. Even though Jonah said, no, I'm out of here, instead of just squashing him or let him go his way, God pursued Jonah across the street, the sea. Now, as we've already talked about, those Ninevites were some horrible and barbaric people. But here's what they've got going for them. You know what? At least they were pagans. At least they didn't have a relationship with God in the midst of their sin. At least some portion of their rebellion and their disobedience toward God came out of just sheer ignorance. Jonah's rebellion towards God was a pure and unabashed fist-shaking in God's face. In a sense, Jonah's sin toward God was more grievous than that of the Ninevites. 
But still, God pursues him. God goes after him. God doesn't give up on him. He doesn't squash him. And just like the sailors, God also pursued Jonah with a storm. The storm wasn't just meant to open the eyes of the sailors, but also Jonah. Because in that storm, he saw that he could not run from God. There was no escaping him, that God controlled his life, even if he didn't like it. And Jonah ended up in the drink. But we should not think that this was somehow a punishment from God for Jonah. The storm wasn't a punishment from God or, you know, or God's vengeance being played out on Jonah. Instead, it was a wake-up call for Jonah. It was a sign to him that God was still pursuing him. But then the sailors toss him into the water. The, the sea is stilled. And then finally we see that God pursues Jonah also with a fish. Verse 17 chapter 1. It says, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, Jonah is one of those dangerous books of the Bible because I think most of us have learned the story of, of Jonah since we were in Sunday school, since we were, you know, just really tiny children, if you've grew up in the church. So you're, you know the story of Jonah, don't you? Oftentimes, when this story is taught to children, we kind of give it a, a, a vengeful spin to it, almost like we, we tell ourselves or we tell others, well, that's what you get when you run from God. You get, fall, you get swallowed by a fish until you learn your lesson. That is not the point of this story or of even God sending the fish to swallow Jonah. The fish was not a punishment against Jonah. Rather, I would tell you that it was a rescue plan, like a life preserver for Jonah. Because you'll notice that verse 17 says that God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. See, Jonah wasn't swallowed by accident. No, God appointed a fish to swallow him. And when that fish swallowed Jonah, you know what happened? Jonah's life was saved. Because guess what? If you're thrown adrift in the middle of the ocean, you're not going to last too long. You're going to drown, and that's what happens to Jonah. If you look ahead in chapter 2, he says he's sinking down to the depths. The seaweed is wrapped around his head. He's being enclosed in by sandbars at the bottom of the ocean. He's on his last breath, and then what happens? His life is saved when this giant fish swallows him. The fish wasn't a punishment against Jonah. It was a rescue plan to save his life. And then, 600 years later, Jesus walks on the earth and he connects this fish that swallows Jonah to his own life and death. He said that Jonah being swallowed by the fish was a foreshadowing of his own death and resurrection. I mean, think about it. You've all heard of fish stories, right? Somebody goes fishing, they come back with a fish story. Think about somebody who went fishing and then came back and told you, you know, I didn't catch any fish but the fish caught me, and I was actually swallowed by a fish, and then for three days, and then later I was vomited up, and you, you what? <laughs> you wouldn't believe that. That doesn't happen to people. You would assume that a person would die from something like that, and that's what Jesus says about himself, and that's how he is like Jonah, because like Jonah, Jesus is going to go to a place that nobody comes back from. If you get swallowed by a fish, you're not coming back. And if you die and go to the grave, you're not coming back. But Jesus says that's exactly what would happen with him, just like it happened with Jonah. He would go to a place of death, and he would come back alive. A place that ought to have been a place of death became a place of deliverance and life, both in Jonah's case and in Jesus' case. See, God pursues us to the place of death, and he brings us out alive through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because again, we're just like those Ninevites. Our sin demands a punishment. It deserves death. But God says, I will go to that place of punishment and death, but I will come back alive. And when we put our faith and our trust in the Son of God, we join in that victory and in that life. We go to that place of death and come out alive because Jesus has conquered it. He has been there before us. But as far as Jonah is current concerned, he is now in that place of death, but he's going to, that place of death has become a place of life for him because it saved him from drowning. 
And still, so here he is in the belly of this fish, and still God pursues Jonah. You know what? No amount of distance between you and God is too far for him to not pursue you. Wherever you are, God will find you. Whether you're in the belly of the fish or the bottom of the ocean or up in space, God can pursue you wherever you are and where he finds Jonah is in the belly of this fish. So Jonah chapter 2 now, verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Now think about that for a minute. Think about the belly of a fish. Have you ever seen the movie Pinocchio? There's a scene in there where Pinocchio is swallowed by a whale and it kind of shows him in this large cavernous space that's supposedly the belly of the fish, and he's kind of floating on a raft. And I think a lot of times when we think about Jonah being swallowed by the fish, that's the image that comes into our mind, right? We see Jonah, you know, on his knees, and maybe he's on a raft or something in a pool of water on a big tongue or something, right? And maybe he's even got like a candle. Where do you get the candle from? How is there light in there? Okay, that is not what Jonah was like. That's not what being in the belly of the fish was not like. It was not like Pinocchio. It was probably pitch black in that fish's stomach and silent. Maybe he could hear the fish's heartbeat. It was probably warm and slimy and smelly. I mean, imagine it's probably not a very big cavernous space. I'm sure Jonah was squished in there very tightly. Some of you know that last week I was on a fishing trip And just to give you a taste of what it might have been like for Jonah, here's a a walleye that I caught. You can kind of see down his mouth there. I mean, imagine being down. Now, you're going to have to think, multiply that by 20 or 30 times to get to a size of a fish that could swallow a human being. But that's what it would be like. And you can see my finger in there reaching up through the gills, which I didn't try to do. But imagine going down there. It's not going to be a big cavernous room that you can kneel down and pray in. But get this, here's the amazing thing. Although Jonah is in the belly of this fish, he actually interprets this as a good thing that has happened to him. He is glad that he has been swallowed by this fish. So look at Jonah 2, verse 2. He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The, wa- uh, excuse me, the waters closed in over, to take, to, to, over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. How did God bring Jonah's life up from the pit? By having him swallowed by a great fish. See, Jonah is in that horrible, stinky, slimy, constricted, dark place, and there's nowhere else he'd rather be because his only other option is to be at the bottom of the ocean. So God is pursuing Jonah by having him go through this disgusting, terrifying process of being swallowed by a fish. And Jonah is thankful for being in the belly of this fish. This is what he says in verse 7, chapter 2. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pray, who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So in the, middle, in the belly of this fish, Jonah praises God for saving his life. But Jonah is not yet out of danger. He did not have a guarantee from God of his safety. You'll notice if you look at chapter 2, that's Jonah's prayer, God doesn't say anything to Jonah while he's in the fish. At least that's recorded for us in these verses. And what's even more fascinating about what Jonah says in chapter 2 is actually what he doesn't say. Because look at those verses in chapter 2. Is there something missing? I would think if I were reading this, and if I was was one of Jonah's friends, I would say, hey, dude, you never even addressed the fact that you totally disregarded God's command to you in the first place. If you look at that prayer in chapter 2 where Jonah is talking about go sinking down and then being brought up out of the pit by the fish, Jonah never once says to God, oh, 
And Lord, I'm sorry that I kind of, you know, shook my fist at you and said, no, I'm not doing what you want me to do. Jonah never turns from his sin while he's in the fish. He never says, I'm sorry, Lord. He never repents of his rebellion against God. Jonah has yet to see his sin. But notice this miracle. Although God has pursued Jonah all the way to the belly of this fish, Jonah is still far away from pursuing God. So here is Jonah in the most divinely orchestrated location in the world, and yet he doesn't see his sin, but God still pursues him. Sure, Jonah is glad that he's in the fish and he's not dead, but he still hasn't dealt with the sin that has actually led him there. And again, God would be within his rights to say, fine, <laughs> I'm just going to let you get digested or, or squashed again or, or you know, put him back out in the ocean. Forget it. But God doesn't do that. He still pursues Jonah. He still goes after him. He still wants Jonah to return that same affection toward him. Now, what does that tell you about God? It should tell you that God doesn't give up on people. God gives second chances and third and fourth and 568th chances. That's about as many as Jonah needed. And it should tell you that you are worth pursuing because God has created you in his image and he desires to save you and help you. Maybe this morning God is pursuing you to save you from your sin. Maybe this morning he is pursuing you because you are either knowingly or unknowingly running away from his will. And so he has sent a storm into your life to shake you up and get your attention. Maybe you are at this very moment feeling as though you are in the belly of a great fish and it's not very pleasant. If that's how you feel, then remember that God sent the fish because he loves you, because he's pursuing you, because he longs for the best for you. So don't harden your heart. Don't pull a Jonah. <laughs> Submit to God and answer his call. Turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus who went down into that dark pit for you and he came out alive. And in his coming out, that place of death has become a place of life. So I just ask you this morning, how is God pursuing you today? For some, he is calling you to turn from your sin and to put your trust in Jesus who went down into that dark place. For some, he's sent you a storm. He's trying to get your attention. How is God trying to get your attention if you're that person in the storm? For some of you, you're in that belly of the great fish. How is God pursuing you in that belly? And can you even acknowledge that God has sent you there to save you, to rescue you from something? How is God pursuing you this morning? If you'd like to talk about how God is pursuing you, I'm certainly available. I'll stay right down here in the front this morning if you'd like to come and talk about how God is pursuing you and how you can respond to him and his call towards you. Come see me after the service. But remember, God is pursuing you, each one of us, this morning in some way. Answer his call. Let's pray. God, we do thank you that you are a God who pursues people and even pursues them in light of their disobedience and their wickedness and their vileness. Lord, I know that I count myself in that bunch. But Lord, you have seen fit to pursue me. So I praise you. I praise you for loving me and saving me. God, I ask that this morning as you reach out and your Holy Spirit goes out to people this morning to convict them or to lead them or, or to encourage them or to give them wisdom or guidance in a certain area, Lord, that you would give them the grace to hear that call and to respond to it, whether it to be to trust in you for the forgiveness of sins for the first time or even to respond to your leading and guiding in a particular issue. Lord, give us the grace and, uh, of obedience. Give us the grace of responding to what you have called us to do. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.